The object of the act is to make sure that intellectual property emanating from publicly financed research and development is identified, protected, utilized, and commercialized for the benefit of the people of the Republic, whether it be for social, economic, or other benefits. It further puts a responsibility on the recipient of public funds to identify <coughs> um, opportunities for commercialization, make sure that human ingenuity and creativity is, is um, rewarded, and to have a preferential access for small and medium enterprises and triple B, double E entities. The Act, unfortunately, doesn't define <coughs> research and development. So the NIPMO guideline um, was uh, published and it took from the Frascati manual wherein we roughly defined research and development as having an element of novelty and that is providing a solution to the problem. So the scope of our act, and this is the last legal words I would hopefully say, is that any creation of the mind that is capable of being protected, that is funded by state, organ of state or state agency, um, and that recipient of that funds and the outputs they generated, that is the scope of the IPR Act. Our core functions, NIPMO is in the process of being established as a specialized service delivery unit within the Department of Science and Technology. If you do not know the word, don't feel horrible. This is going to be the first of its kind in South Africa. So we're not 100% sure what that means as well. But basically, we know that we're going to have three directorates, which would be a regulatory and compliance, which will handle the legal aspects of the Act, advisory and support that would um, assist with OTT capacity building, advocacy, education, and learning. And then we'll have a third directorate that would mainly work with funds and the incentive management. I know this is an exceptionally busy slide, but I want to quickly take you through it just to put in place where NIPMO fits into the whole national system of innovation. If we start from the left-hand side, the Department of Education or other government departments would provide funding to the universities and institutions. Those universities and institutions would then generate research and development outputs that will go to their offices of technology transfer. <laughs> The Office of Technology Transfer would first identify, protect, utilize, and commercialize these R&D outputs or put mechanisms in place to do that. And would, if they so deem fit, do an IP registration and further on report it to NIPMO. NIPMO would in turn for your generation or, or the protection of your R&D outputs, we will give you funding for that or we will provide you with assistance in the form of an IP fund. We're also in the process of putting a fund in place which we will call IP Creators Incentive Scheme to incentivize and pro provide assistance and funding to the IP creators situated at the university to encourage them to innovate and create new um, R&D outputs. These I've now described furthermore in my presentation. Um, I've heard that the presentations will be made available after the conference, so I'm not going to go into detail. IP Fund, as I've said, um, it is for, to provide financial support to institutions for statutory protection and maintenance of IP. The Offices of Technology Transfer is staffed by qualified personnel, and they do, they live out the mandates of the IPR Act. They develop policies, they receive the disclosures, they identify, they submit disclosures to NIPMO, and they are, they liaise with NIPMO um, as well. Then, as I've said, the NIPMO incentive scheme, and then we've got a various compliance issues that the OTT offices has to comply with, which would include um, IP, uh, IP transactions that has to go to NIPMO for approval, IP policies that has to come to us, and the review of non-commercialized IP. What have we done to date? So currently, we've got 33 institutions, 23 universities, and 10 research councils. We're glad to say that all 33 institutions has got a OTT, um, an Office of Technology Transfer, or a person within the University or Research Council that has a function or functioning as an OTT. All 33 institutions has got some sort of form of IP policy. NIPMO is mandated to Thanks. NIPMO is mandated to approve some provisions within the Act, what we uh, approve as non-monetary benefits, and to ensure that the preference clauses for the BEEs 
um, is in place. Currently, 28 has been um, approved, and the other five is with the universities and research councils, just for slight amendments. Then, as I've stated previously, the universities has got a report to NIPMO biannually on the IP status and commercialization reports, basically what their output is and how is it going. So we've roughly received about 350 to date. That is now since August to August 2010. Of that, 70% is under evaluation, which means it is pending protection, a provisional going through various phases, basically not a granted right. 21% is disclosed and protected. It's been afforded a granted right, patent right, designs, plant breeders' rights, trademarks. 6% has been licensed, pre-revenue, and 3% has been commercialized with a reported revenue of around about 2.3 million rand. NIPMO has paid out, in terms of the IP fund, around about 27 million rand to assist universities with the IP protection and maintenance costs. The Act has created around about 48 jobs within the universities and the OTT offices, and we've given about 27.7 million rand for OTT support. We're further in the process of the development of an LLM course in intellectual property management and innovation, because advocacy is very important for our office. And that is why in the past two years we've We've got an IP-wise campaign where we go to universities and educate the researchers about the implications of intellectual property and, and basically just what is intellectual property and its effect. So we've trained about 500 researchers. We've held three commercialization workshops. And we've got a two-week um, training course in association with WIPO where we've also trained around about just over 100 people. Further, we provide um, assessment tools for the institutions so that they can do their own novelty searches and so create capacity within an institution. And we've got an OTT framework and manual. And then as a last point, <laughs> NIPMO provides guidelines for the um, stakeholders on how to interpret and implement the Act. We've got our first guideline has been published, uh, which is entitled The Interpretation and Application of the IPR Act. The IP Fund Guideline has also been published. And before March, or within March 2014, we will have three more guidelines out entitled NIPMO Incentives for IP Creators, the IP Ownership Guideline, which will deal with the ownership of publicly financed IP with our next panel session as well, and the referral. What do we do when there is no statute protection or decision? And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm a little puzzled. My name is Heloise Emden. I'm a South African, but I work in Canada at the moment. I work for a university. And um, the IP agreement there is, is contained in the collective agreement with, with faculty. The university doesn't own their IP, even if it's publicly funded. The individual owns IP. So I'd really like to know how you've tied up IP of a publicly funded entity, uh, the individual's IP in the publicly funded entity. That's number one. Um, number two is it seems like you pre-industry, because normally IP evolves out of an interaction between an industry-funded activity and the, the faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm seeing you do here is you saying, no, 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 hold on to your publicly funded IP. We'll help you commercialize it. Well, there are stacks and stacks of patents that have never been commercialized because of this kind of blocking process. So I'm really worried about this process. Um, with in terms of your second question, the commercialization, we are, um, the IPR Act states, and I haven't done, the, the, this was not part of my presentation, that all publicly financed research and development shall be owned by the recipient. Therefore, the institution, <coughs> the university, will own the IP that is generated from the R&D. In terms of commercialization, we do realize that commercialize, that is not the mandate of the university to commercialize IP. They're there to educate, train, and research. So we do realize that collaborative um, 
relationships with industry is important, and we do encourage that. So within the Act, we've got um, joint IP ownership as well as one provision, and we encourage the universities to seek a commercial commercialization partner or entity or industry that will most suitably for the benefits of South Africa commercialize that IP. We do understand that the universities will not have the capacity necessarily unless they spin out a company, have the capacity within them to commercialize all the IP that is generated from publicly financed research and development. That said, as a as just an, another point to add to the IPR Act, should an industry partner come to university and fund research and development on a full cost basis, basically that no taxpayer's money went into this um, research project, the IPR Act will not be applicable. And the university and that industry partner is free to negotiate ownership, licensing, commercialization of that specific outputs as they deem fit and necessary. It's only when our taxpayers' money is going into a project that the IPR Act is applicable and setting certain kinds of administrative barriers, no, not barriers, administrative steps that they have to take in order to ensure that our, the, the generated IP is not given away to an offshore company or to someone for free and our taxpayers' money is not accounted for. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Joelle Buntio from University of Pretoria. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, the first is um, still on the, on the the idea that it is taxpayers' money that is used in the first place to fund the research, and so there should be some returns back to the taxpayer. What I want to find out is how does NUPMO, for instance, ensure that um, if UCT, for instance, is working on a particular government-funded research project, and that uh, some researchers say that UP needs access to the particular research or some components of the research to conduct his own equally public funded research, he has access to that particular research. Doesn't the fact that UCT, for instance, has patented the research block any other researcher involving other forms of publicly funded research? That's the one thing. The other is um, each university having technology transfer offices. I mean, in countries like, say, the US, where tech transfer has been operational for, over th for about 30 years today, there's always a debate as to whether it is really viable for each university to have a tech transfer office because it is sometimes really expensive to run the office, especially considering that not all universities will one day come up with, say, blockbuster inventions that would bring them returns on what they invest in, uh, in maintaining the offices and all the like. So, I mean, even the funding that you cited, it's, it's perhaps huge, but it's still not enough even for the university. So how does that, how is that uh, taken care of? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, with regards to your first question of access to IP, uh, what we found is that the university's got a very good working relationship. The researchers in specific fields got a fairly good relationship with each other. They are not blocked. Um, should UCT want to give access of their IP to University of Pretoria for on a royalty-free basis, they are allowed to do so. The check for NIPMA would be that that um, they would fill in a specific form indicating the reason why they want to allow University of Pretoria to have access to that information for free and why that person would utilize it as well and then that exchange of IP can happen should NIPMA approve it. I can say that to date we've received um, 53 royalty free license requests just for 2013 and we do not necessarily unnecessarily withheld approval um, if your motivation is in line with the objectives of the IPR Act. Then with regards to your second question of OTT, um, South Africa is in the beginning phases of, uh, well, South Africa, this act is fairly new and the act prescribes that OTT offices has to be established and we feel that that is a fantastic point for the university to collect what is going on in university, assess um, whether registration protection should be um, should be taken and to commercialize the R&D outputs. Otherwise, you sit with a decentralized system within a university, which previously, previously worked, but this centralized system we feel is currently, that is currently operational, is working very well for a lot of universities. Yes, it is expensive, but some of the universities, um, we think it's effective and it is fulfilling the objectives of the IPR Act. Uh, 
a question for students or researchers who develop a product or an idea to reach a patent. Are they getting shares? Because if I sit down writing a proposal, wasting my energy, and then the university is the only owner of the IPR, that is not good. It's, it's good to have a percentage for even the one who is the innovator himself. Um, answer your question the way the university will, unfortunately in South African law, the university will own that IP that you generated as a student. However, Section 10 of the Act makes provision for benefit sharing with IP creators, which means that 20%, 20 percent, 20, 20 percent of the first 1 million rand revenue that comes to the university has got to be given to the IP creators, and thereafter 30 percent of the net revenue has to go to the IP creator or its heirs until the right expires. So although you will not necessarily own the intellectual property generated, you, you are legislatively obliged to benefit sharing, receive, um, receive benefits from the revenue of your IP. No, no, your name is definitely on the patent. Your name, sh your, your name is definitely on the patent because you're an IP creator. Great. Thank you, Jitani.